Uh, Why don't you you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we come to you this morning. Father, I am just uh, humbled by this morning's prayer requests. Uh, Just the tragedy, Father, in our community and beyond, and uh, not only in Pittsburgh, but here in Brevard County, just loss of life, loss of new husbands, loss of students. Uh, Father, it just seems like the word you have for us this morning is perfectly timed. Uh, So so we pray, Father, this morning as we enter into sanctuary uh, that we would not be resistant to rest, Uh, that whatever we think is waiting for us when we're done here can't surely be more important than being with you. And so we pray this in your son's precious and holy name and all of God's children said, amen. amen. As we get started this morning, I want to take a moment and thank Janice for preaching last week uh, so that I can be away. Um, we had a great chance to go away with some friends and to celebrate Dee Dee's birthday. But part of what I want to say about what Janice did last week, uh, I spend most of the year uh, watching sermons. I'm part of a committee of people that ordains ministers. And one of the things they have to do is they have to pass a preaching test. And so I see lots and lots of bad sermons and <laughs> bad preachers. And what you need to understand, uh, what happened last Sunday was an anointed word from the Lord that was Janice preached last Sunday. I'm telling you right now, if you missed last Sunday, it's a sermon everybody ought to hear. It's a sermon everybody ought to probably hear twice. Uh, it's because if you do not believe that we are in the midst of spiritual warfare, uh, then you are living in a place that is dangerous for you. Uh, So that was an anointed word of God. I've asked Janice to just ghostwrite all my sermons now. Uh, So so anyway, Uh, Janice and I did have a chance this past week. We sat in our office, kind of talked about the series and unpacked her sermon and just kind of talked about where we're at. And and I shared with her in a moment of vulnerability, just to say, listen, this week's sermon for me is probably the most challenging for me of the seven to write. Uh, not because I don't understand prayer as sanctuary or that I don't practice prayer as sanctuary. Uh, it's just not how I'm naturally wired. It's just, it's just not who I am. I think you know this about me. I'm a hard-charging guy. My life is Mach 3 and engaging the enemy. I have a sense of urgency about the mission. I want to take the hill. I want to stand at the gates of hell and prevent anyone from throwing their life away for an eternity. I want to be praying on my feet so when the spirit blows, I'm ready to go where he needs me to go. And my prayer life reflects this style most frequently. If if you've noticed, our first four weeks in this series approach prayer from the same kind of uh, aggressive perspective. Prayer is preparation for life. Prayer as deliverance. Prayer is a life on fire. Prayer as warfare. It's prayer on the offensive, taking ground in the name of Jesus Christ. What I'm not so good at is being still. Not so good at that. I'm not so good at slowing down, being contemplative. Nobody's ever said, wow, that Corky, he's pretty contemplative. Uh, You know, (laughs) I, I I am not very good in sitting in silence. It is just not my natural style, right? But I do realize that it's critical for all of us, myself included, to have a safe place. A time for being still. A sanctuary of both protection and peace. And I never regret going there, but to be honest, I I just resist it sometimes. I've shared this story over the years a couple of times, and I think it fits so well today that if you've heard it before, just kind of bear with me, but some of you haven't. When I was in seminary, one of my assignments was a weekend retreat at a Jesuit monastery uh, that had dedicated monastic living to silence, right? It was in the mountains of northern Georgia, so it was beautiful, it was breathtaking, Lots of trees. They owned a gorgeous, Jesuits owned all the best property. And it's, um, it, it literally was a silent retreat for four days. No talking, no phones, no TV, no eye, anything. Literally, the only thing you could bring with you is a change of clothes, a toothbrush, and your Bible, and they checked you at the door, right? So, so literally, it, it just, this means, that meant for me that at least three to five times a day, I would be around people. I just couldn't talk. Everything went well. It was very quiet. Um, (laughs) That evening, I took a long walk, and God and I had a good talk. Good talk, God and I. Good, good talk. Long talk, actually. And uh, then I went to dinner, which was really stretching for me because we sat in a room full of people in silence, and, you know, you had to point at the butter. I mean, it was really kind of creepy. It was weird. And and then I went back to my room, and there's no tea. So I read my Bible for four hours, and 
That was a long time for me. And then by morning breakfast, by the time that came, I was ready to chat some folks up. <laughs> you know? How'd you sleep? How'd you sleep? How'd that go, right? Right? But more silence followed, right? So I took another walk in the mountains of North Georgia, and even God seemed surprised to hear from me so soon again, <laughs> right? was kind of like, didn't we just talk yesterday? I mean, it was like, well, you, it's, it's literally like I hear, hear God say, you again? I mean, it was like weird, right? So I sat under a tree, a big oak tree. It was beautiful. I read my Bible till noon. And then we had noontime prayers. So again, we gather in a sanctuary like this, no speaking, no music, no sound, and you just pray in total silence. So lunch comes, and I mean, you know, I can't ask my buddy, how's your sandwich? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, so by 2 p.m. Saturday, I couldn't take it anymore. Uh, I kept thinking, I kept thinking, Dee Dee would love this place. <laughs> Dee Dee would think she'd died and gone to Jesuit heaven, right? Whatever that looks like, right? But me, I was losing my ever loving mind, right? Right, and it wasn't being alone that was the problem. I do alone, okay. It was putting me with people and then expecting me to not engage them. It's a huge temptation for me. Literally, mission failure, right? Mission failure, right? So I went to the head monk in the brown dress, and um, they all wore brown dresses. I did think, this is good for the wardrobe. You know, what shall I wear Sunday? Oh, the brown dress, right. So anyway... So, so you have to write him a note. You can't speak. So I wrote him a note that said, if I don't get out of here, and here was big and bold, if I do not get out of here, I am going to cause someone else to sin <laughs> and break their vow of silence, right? Which would be bad for both of us, right? He gladly released me <laughs> with a written note and a smile. <laughs> Then I go, right? I, you should have seen this, man. And then he goes, he says, could he pray for me? Sure, right? So he comes across his desk, places my hands on his, his hands on my shoulder, and I think he began to pray. <laughs> because again, it was in silence. <laughs> so periodically I had to just kind of, And so then he, at some point, he squeezed my shoulder, which is the universal sign that we're done with Jesus, right? So listen, 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 listen. There were lots of spiritual takeaways for me. I learned God does need me to periodically shut up, all right? I mean, literally, God needs me just, God just wants to say, shut up, man. Quit talking so much. And I realized it's actually good for me to be still. But 36 hours is about the shelf life on silence for me, right? That's just about all I can do. It's not a discipline I'm good at. God wired me for people. That's how I'm wired. So the thing is, is I believe we all need sanctuary, a safe place, a place where we can come spiritually naked before God, a place where vulnerability is both welcome and expected, a place where our hearts can be protected from the judgmentalism of the world. I believe it should happen in here each Sunday when we are in community. Facing a dark world together. The thing is, the thing is, is Jesus, in Jesus, we can have sanctuary anytime, at any place, with the Father, everywhere we go throughout the day. Sanctuary, the safe place, the safe place, is only a prayer way. You simply, you simply have to make time for it. All right, so I'm going to pause that sermon right there because this is something's driving me crazy. Can we just open that other door so everybody can see out? So we have people out in the narthex, and I'm feeling really bad for them because... I'm preaching to you too, and I can't see you. I just can see people trying to look around the door. So there we go. I feel so much better. Thank you for doing that for me. All right, let me share a passage with you this morning that will set the tone for our conversation today. In Matthew 11, Jesus says words that I think we know really, really well. We just don't live very well. So he says this. He said, come unto me, all of you who are weary. Anybody in the room weary? Anybody in the room weary? And burdened, he said, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy 
and my burden is light. We know it really, really well. We stink at living it, right? So come, take, and learn. Come, take, and learn. Come, take, and learn. This is the pattern of prayer as sanctuary. First of all, we must literally come unto him. We must get up, seek him, look for him, enter into his presence. We must drag ourselves out of the despair and fear of being fully known by God and actually want to find him. And trust me, when we begin to look, you're going to find that he is right there because he has been chasing you and pursuing you and wanting a relationship with you. So you don't have to go far. You don't have to look far and wide. He is right there. Secondly, Jesus says, take my yoke. In other words, we must accept his pace. We must accept his direction. We must accept that his ways are not always going to be our ways. And if we're honest, most of the time when we come un up unto him... We end up rejecting the yoke. It's why peace is so fleeting for so many. We reject the yoke. We want to be in his presence. I don't know that I want to go in the same direction as Jesus goes. Lastly, he says we must be willing to learn. Learn to be still. Learn to trust. Learn to listen. Learn the benefits of obedience and learn what it means to be loved under the wing of God's protection. Come, take, and learn. This is the rhythm of the pattern of sanctuary prayers. So let me ask you this morning, do you have a place of shelter where you seek only his face? Do you spend time alone with God or do you share it with a cluttered mind of endless tugs and pulls? Have, have you given prayer the priority that it deserves? And when you do pray, do you pray with the remembrance that the sole purpose is to seek his face, not necessarily to seek him as some sort of cosmic divine counselor? Personally, I think we have to keep in mind that God is a good God. He wants good things for our life. But if this is true, then it also means that we have an adversary who also has a plan for our life, and that plan is not good for our life. Why would we ever avoid the one person who, is the, who only wants good for our life? Why would we stubbornly try to go it alone? Why would we try to do life on our own? You see, the enemy wants to call us out from God and a community of believers. He likes it when you're alone. If he can get you alone, if he can get you alone with your thoughts, if, he, if the enemy can get you alone away from people to encourage you, if he can break you away from the pack, then you are vulnerable for attack. You are vulnerable to be devoured. He wants you to think that you can go it alone. The fact is, it's not every minute of our life is good, correct? We live in a broken world full of uncertainties. Our bodies are broken by infirmities. Our minds are broken by the swirling lies about who we are. The weather is broken all over the world. The country is divided by hatred. Everywhere we look, we see the fruits of our rebellion from the creator God. The thing is, God didn't promise perfection. He just promised peace. And then he sent his peacemaker so that we would never be without it, no matter what was swirling around us. The problem is that so many of us have either rejected the peacemaker or have turned our back on him in stubborn defiance. Mark Driscoll, the pastor out west, once said, Jesus alone has faced what you face. He has endured what you are enduring, and he has beaten what you are battling. Most of the truths that were given in scriptures were written in an environment of incredible uncertainty. This book that anchors our soul is not filled with feel-good messages of a world we do not live in. In this book, we find God speaking directly into the chaos of uncertainty. Maybe more comforting to us is that we see example after example after example of God's hand in the midst of this uncertainty. Just think of a few examples. There are hundreds. There's a few. Joseph, in the Old Testament, finds himself in a pit while his brothers above are debating whether to sell him into slavery or kill him. And then it says we discover that God was with him. King David was awakened one morning to the rumor that his own son was conspiring against him. In fact, many of the Psalms reflect the uncertainty that filled the life of the one for whom Scripture, scripture says has a heart after God's own heart. And then it says, and God was with him. Gideon was the least member of his family in the least tribe of Israel when God tapped him on the shoulder to defeat the enemies of God. And it said, and God was with him. One afternoon, an angel appeared to a backwoods teenager and informed her that she would soon, despite never having been with a man, give birth to a son, that that son then would transform and change the world. And it says, and God was with her. 
A woman was caught in adultery and was about to be stoned to death when Jesus stepped in and God was with her. Paul finds himself writing letters of encouragement to the churches that he planted amidst horrible division and heresy, all while shackled to the wall of stone in a prison cell, and it says God was with him. This book is filled with story after story of people facing uncertainty and challenges, and God was with them. You see, sanctuary is mobile because God is always a breath away. He is not bound by brick and mortar or circumstances, and he will invade the uncertainty of our lives with incredible power and strength if you will only call unto him. If you'll only call unto him. This book is about how much God loves you and will never forsake you. This book, this book is about how very much God is in control and we're not. And therein lies the rub. We like control, right? We don't want to surrender control. We don't want to give it to anybody. I think the modern understanding of this is that we in our minds always think we're three things away from getting it fixed. If I do these next three things, this will fix whatever my uncertainty is, right? Whereas when I meet people in my office, the greater truth is probably they're one more bad decision away from wrecking their life for eternity. They're not three decisions away from getting it fixed. They're one decision for, from a train wreck, right? But we just think in our mind, I, I can get this thing under control. I can do this, right? The fact is, is we actually don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to fasten our seatbelts. We just want the turbulence to go away. We don't want to be guided through difficult times. We don't want to be led around them. We want a God that will guarantee our safety to end terrorism, to put our political party in control, to make our places of worship safe, to cure cancer, to give us a booming economy and endless days of happiness. Where are those verses, we ask? <laughs> right? I want those verses. And so we live in the tension between what we want and the reality of what is. And the result is a life filled with uncertainty, filled with anxiety and panic and fear and overreactions. You and I need sanctuary. I, I meet more people who are tired and exhausted and worn to frazzle, just grinding life out. I talked to a guy this week, he, that was his phrase. He said, dude, I'm just grinding it now. I'm just grinding life out. This is not, just, in, just not enjoying life, you're just enduring it. And we live in a, we live in a culture, literally, where more people are weary, and, and self-medication is at an all-time high in our country. And still, and still, despite all of that reality, people will not make time to pray. They can't find time to pray, right? But God has made it clear. He says, I am here if you will seek me. If you will anchor your life in my word, if you will trust your soul in prayer, he said, I am sanctuary. Come inside me and close the door to uncertainty and you will find peace and you will find rest but you must enter me. This is sanctuary. Go to Psalm 91. These are one of those great psalms. You should just print this. We're going to read the whole thing in honor of Nathan. I love Nathan. All right, Psalm 91. You should just print it, put it on a mirror. You should memorize it, but it's really long. Um, maybe, well, maybe just verse 1. Verse 1 of Psalm 91 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. We could just stop right there, right? I mean, if we just own that, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. But it goes on to say, I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be with you, right? His faithfulness will be with you, will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, and it will not come near you. You will not only observe, bless you, you will, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment for the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling... No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their, with their hands, in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. 
Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him with long life, and I will satisfy him, and he will be, and I will show him the way of salvation. Maybe every one of our prayers ought to begin with the phrase, the Lord is my refuge. This is the promise of God. I think we have to acknowledge that none of us have it all together, much less completely have life figured out. These are complex days in which we live, and it is extremely challenging to maintain a healthy soul along the way. But here's what I hope is true for all of you. I hope all of you can say, I love God. I have an authentic desire to serve him and be faithful to his mission. Because Psalm 91 says, if this is your stance, God then promises to go with you no matter where you go, no matter what your circumstances are. Why is it? Why is it that we are so rust resistant? Jeremiah 16, 16 says this. This is what the Lord stands, says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient past. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said... This is Jeremiah says, but you said we will not walk in it. See, God's providing a way. We just are stubborn. Most people do not find sanctuary or rest because they resist it. I have discovered that I want to do life from a full soul and have a ministry that's done from a place of joy, even when most of my days are literally one dumpster fire after another, then I need sanctuary moments. I need moments of rest. I need moments where the well-being of someone else isn't dependent on me for about 10 minutes. For this, for this, this means that rest means I must stop something. Rest reminds me that I am not God. I do not spin the planets. I do not blow the spirit. I do not choose the music on Sunday mornings. I keep telling you that because you think I do. Right? Email Luis. Literally. Rest, rest acknowledges that I have limits. Rest is about being in his holy presence and denial of selfishness. Rest is finding quiet places intentionally. Rest is about creating time and space to refill. The biblical idea is that Jesus' yoke fits. It's made for us. It's agreeable. It works. And until we learn to rest in God, we will never know the best of God. I think, honestly, can we be honest? I think we generally stink at Sabbath. We generally stink at Sabbath. God gave us Sabbath as a model of rest. We generally have leveraged Sabbath as a fuel for the coming week, which it can be for sure. But it was, in meant, it was meant to be an intentional act of rest. Practicing Sabbath means entering into the rest of God. God didn't create the Sabbath for all the things we use it for. God didn't create the Sabbath for brunch. God didn't create the Sabbath for the golf course or for boating or beaching or gardening or even ooh, football. He made it for rest. Now listen, 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 listen. None of those things are bad things. We just shouldn't commingle them with the Sabbath and think it is Sabbath. Keeping Sabbath holy is all about realignment and reorientation around the holiness of God. Sabbath resets the pace of life. Sabbath restores our identities as sons and daughters and heirs to the kingdom, reminding us that we are no longer slaves to sin. We have so twisted the idea of rest that the way we do Sabbath is no longer recognizable to a holy God. Time with God was meant to be a blessing, not a hindrance to our play. Sabbath was meant to be life-giving because God even recognized these poor people need a day to be filled with me and to rest. So for the last two weeks, because I know I stink at this, for the last two weeks, I've been looking at this issue of solitude and silence. And I I knew I needed to reorient my life around these concepts and this fundamental practice of sanctuary life and all this kind of stuff. So I dug into the Gospel of Mark. I'd seen this months and months ago. So in this Gospel, we see Jesus regularly withdraw from people daily life activities and the demands of ministry to be alone with God the Father. And he prays. Solitude and silence is a major theme throughout the Gospel of Mark. Jesus' practice of solitude and silence 
is everywhere in the Gospel of Mark. It's how he begins his ministry. It's how he makes important decisions. It's how he dealt with troubling emotions and grief. It's how he dealt with constant pressures of ministry and guiding and shaping the twelve. It's how he prepared for big ministry events and how he faced death on a cross. He did it from his knees. He did it in prayer with the Father. So I simply spent the last two weeks learning about solitude and silence from the Master. So for 14 straight days, I read the book of Mark every morning in one sitting, no interruption, my cell phone in another room, no music playing, just silence. Mark 1 all the way to the end. Just so you know, it takes about 70 minutes to read the book of Mark, which many biblical scholars say is how you should read the book of Mark. Mark was written in a hurry, probably because Mark knew his death was imminent, it was looming, he knew his days were numbered. In fact, Mark's favorite expression throughout his entire gospel, when you read it beginning to end over and over again, he uses the same word 39 times. He uses the word immediately. There's a sense of urgency for Mark. Mark is fired up. He's so excited about to tell us the life and death and resurrection of Jesus that he literally does not tell us about his birth. He literally waterboards the readers with this gospel. Mark is breathless with enthusiasm to share the good news that Jesus has made the kingdom of God available to all of us. And here's the irony. More than any other gospel, any more than any other gospel writer, Mark shares how Jesus gets away to times of solitude and silence. I think the gospel of Mark looks like our life. Mark 3, Mark 3, Mark 3. Oh, let's get away and rest and pray. Mark 3, Mark 3, Mark 3. Oh, 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 oh. we need to get a rest. Rest and pray. Rest and pray. Mark 3, Mark 3, Mark 3. Rest and pray. It's this pattern, right? There are 17 times in the book of Mark where Jesus gets away from the noise and the clutter and the chaos to be still with his father. I just kept asking myself as I read every day, 38 years I've been a Christian. How did I miss this? How did I miss this, right? Mark 135 is the primary example. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus lived in a particular rhythm of life that was essential to his well-being essential to his own faith life and his ministry to others. He had a way of life with his father that connected holiness with wholeness. It's a sample of sanctuary prayers that he gives us, but it required Jesus to withdraw. Think about it. The son of God had to withdraw. Think about it. For three years, Jesus focused on investing himself, on discipling the 12 and the other eager learners. He encouraged them. He served them. He answered their questions. He taught them how to live and love, Right? And then the byproduct of this investment of time and energy into these 12 is the 12 influenced a number of other people, and they influenced thousands of other people, and eventually it got to you and I. It's what we call the ripple effect of grace. The investment of Christ in us so that we might then be depositors of love and mercy and grace in the lives of others to the glory of God. So how did Jesus do this? Where did his strength come from? His endless compassion, his wisdom, his miracle working power. How did he deal with overwhelming demands and stresses of ministry without becoming overstressed and weighed down? How does Jesus avoid burnout? Well, he did it with prayer, solitude, silence, and sitting in the presence of the Father. See, the thing we all have in common is that we have all been overwhelmed, stressed beyond our capacity, and in those moments, we do not exhibit a non-anxious presence or a spirit of calm. In these moments, we lack a defiant joy, and we are far from generous. And yet, and yet, and yet, this invitation to be yoked is so critical for us today because Jesus is the antithesis to how we typically try to do life. Jesus understands that ministry and the distribution of love, wisdom, power, and mercy is nothing more than the overflow of oneness with the Father. He was yoked with the Father, submitted to his Father. And the resulting thing is just literally these unforced rhythms of grace to walk freely and lightly about life with a smile on his face and his hand extended in love to others. Jesus lived with an inside-out rhythm of life. Again and again in the Gospels, we see him withdraw from the crowds and go pray alone in a quiet place by a lake, in the hills, in the desert, on a mountainside. He set time aside to enter the Holy of Holies, to share his heart with his Father. He prayed and he meditated on scriptures, which is why when we gave you the devotion at the beginning of the year, it was both scriptures and prayer, because that's the way Jesus did it. He read scripture and then he prayed. 
Jesus prayed alone and quiet. He prayed in community. He prayed in the synagogue. He prayed on a grassy, grassy hillside. He worshiped and he healed. He fasted and fed the hungry. He rested in quiet and ministered in noisy crowds. He withdrew on retreat and was patient with divine interruptions when they came. And it all began because he prepared his heart with the Father. Right? Prayer is all about setting the inside compass to influence the outside directions of living. It's all about rhythm. There's no denying that a great deal of our life is spent with uncertain, churning waters of what it means to live in a broken world. It makes the invitation to come and escape in prayer so critical. I'm going to tell you that I am healthiest when I get these rhythms right. And I'm going to tell you I am unhealthiest when I get them all out of whack. Prayer isn't about changing things. Prayer is about being changed. Did you catch that? Prayer isn't about changing things. Prayer is about having us changed. We've made sanctuary a place. But if God has taken up residency in your heart, he's a breath away. Sanctuary is everywhere God is. So, so I love I love going to the mountains. Dee's family owns a place in the mountains in North Carolina, so I love going there. I don't know what it is. I sit on the porch. I feel God's presence. I don't know if it's the trees. I don't know if it's the air. I don't know if it's the lack of pollution. I don't know if it's quiet. I don't know what it is. But when I sit on that porch, I feel God's presence. He speaks, and maybe it's just the lack of cloud, whatever it is. But the problem is, is I only get there about once a year. I, I can't go once a year hearing from God. <laughs> Right? I need to hear from him every day. Right? A couple weeks ago, Luis, y'all can come. I'm going to finish up. A couple weeks ago, I was working with some students in my third grade class, and one of them began to share. We're supposed to be working on social studies, but a lot of time, what happens at my table is therapy. So um, <laughs> she began to just share some tough stuff that she was going through. Uh, and I mean, we're talking about some really tough stuff. Bad home life, just challenging things. And, and so while we were working, it occurred to me, that what she needed was sanctuary because her home's not a sanctuary. She doesn't have sanctuary. And so while we're working, I just place my hand on her back and I, and I just kind of bow my head a little bit and I close my eyes and just literally 25, 30 seconds, I just pray sanctuary over her life and I just, I just pray for her. And about this time, I can't make this stuff, she says, Mr. Corky, are you sleeping? <laughs> So open my eyes. <laughs> no, sweetheart, I'm not sleeping. I was, because it's school, right? It's public school. So I said, I was praying for you. So she says, well, I think if you're going to pray for me, you ought to pray out loud so I can hear it. <laughs> so we did a sneaky prayer. Don't tell anybody I did that, right? <laughs> right? Just last week, some students from Rockland High came by our third grade class to give our kids brand new dictionaries. I couldn't help them. They were, kids were thrilled to have brand new dictionaries that they're going to take home. I would have thought that, did you give my boys brand new dictionaries that are gone? Are you kidding me? <laughs> we couldn't get a biography of Peyton Manning or something? I mean, we're crying out loud, right? So, so it was just kind of crazy. They, they came. So the students from Rockledge were giving them words to look up. We were teaching them how to use the dictionary. You kind of know the drill, and it's all kinds of words. And so finally, the students were this fifth word. They said, look up the word goat. So they were looking up the word goat. And then all of a sudden, a little boy goes, I found God. I found God. God's on the page. And then, and then true story, another kid goes, I found God. I found God. And that's just like going through the classroom. Right? They found God. I'm telling you, we have not taken God out of the schools. It's just a matter of the fact that we've quit bringing him in. Right? I mean, he's there. He is there. Out of the mouth of the babe. So literally, literally. Hear the words from Paul and we'll close. Philippians 4. Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Anybody anxious about anything this morning? No? Nope? Good. Good. Glad. <laughs> Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Anyone want to be free of anxiety? Anyone need their hearts guarded? Anyone need a mind of Christ so that you can take captive every thought? Then all you have to do is go to him in prayer, in sanctuary, just block everything else out. And just find that space between you and he. 
and you will receive the benefits that he promised, which is a peace that transcends all understanding. And all of God's children said. I don't, I don't know if this happens to you, but, but have you ever been reading the Bible and asked yourself, how long has that been in there? Right? It's, it's, God's like, oh, about 4,000 years. Right? So, so while I was preparing for the sermon I did two weeks ago when I talked about Pharaoh and Exodus and all that kind of stuff, I came across a passage in Exodus 7 that, that I had just never seen like this before. And I was just reading along, and then it just hit me. And the quote from Exodus 7 says, Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the temp, tent of meeting. And anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside of camp. And then it occurred to me, the phrase that's used in that passage is, Moses used to. Moses used to pitch the, t- pitch the tent of meeting. In other words, by the time the book of Exodus is written, Moses has quit pitching the tent. Moses has quit seeking his face. Moses has quit being intentional about getting with the one who had spoken into his life. For some of us in the room, we just quit pitching the tent. We quit seeking sanctuary. I'm telling you this morning, you need it. If you listen to prayer requests this morning, you know how fragile life is. You need it. You need to find it. you got to start pitching that tent. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. I love you, church. Have a great week.